Uh -huh. All right. Perfect. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good midday. Um, welcome to today's seminar. My name is Patrick Catcher. I'm the acting chair of uh, Pop Fam, and uh, I'm super excited uh, to be able to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Les Roberts is a professor emeritus in PopFam, and uh, he did a postdoctorate fellowship in epidemiology at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he worked uh, for four years, and we overlapped at that time. Um, we also overlapped during my own MPH studies uh, at Hopkins, where he was the teaching assistant for the best course I took uh, during my time there. Um, in 1994, Les worked as an epidemiologist for the World Health Organization in Rwanda during their civil war. And he was director of health policy at the International Rescue Committee from December 2000 until April 2003. Les has led over 50 surveys in 17 countries, mostly measuring human rights violations or mortality associated with times of conflict, such as in the DR Congo, Iraq, and Zimbabwe. His present research has been documenting the changes in behavior and improved health associated with community-based surveillance. He lives in central New York with his wife, Mary Grace, and I'm Pleased to welcome you to the podium, Les. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a study we did. About half of you have already heard me talk about it before, so I'm going to be pretty brief. But I'm going to think about what it means, mostly through the lens of what I've learned from mailman students. <clears throat> so there's a fellow here in the red shirt, and his name is Gang Karume right there. And he runs a Congolese NGO and 18 of our students have done practicums with him. And he was here, I don't know, maybe eight years ago to teach a short course on logistics because that's his thing. And a, a bunch of his former sort of alumni who had done a practicum with him came and joined him for a dinner. Turns out he's pretty center, central to this story. There we go. Just for those of you who haven't taken investigative, investigative methods or those of you who took it last year and forgot, very quickly, crude mortality is the number of people dying per unit population, per unit time. Notice the word crude is in there. Japan and Ghana have about the same mortality rate. Why? Because healthcare in Ghana is as good as Japan? No, because people in Japan are quite old, old people die more. So this is just a general term, which happens to be really, really useful in the poorest of, of countries and settings. And there is this assumption that if it gets up to one death per 10,000 per day, we call that a humanitarian emergency. Officially, the Central African Republic is down at a third that rate, similar to some of the most peaceful countries in Africa. And if you look at the official UN statistics, the death rate in CAR has been going down, 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 in spite of a huge spasm of violence, for example, in 2012 and 13. Very curious. But everyone agrees CAR is one of the poorest countries in the world. By a whole host of, of measures, it is very, very poor. Interestingly, the government has not controlled maybe 60% of the countryside for more than two decades now. That's about 40% of the population. And there is a sort of Muslim Christian split in that divide, but that's not really what this is about. It, has to do with tribes and older uh, grievances that were going for a long time. And the capital is very sort of European oriented. Making matters worse is <clears throat> Lake Chad is drying up. And the largest 
um, tribal group of pastoralists in Africa are called the Fulani. And they have historically gone up towards Lake Chad in the wet season. And when the dry season came, they would sort of move down to the greener areas like Northern Cameroon, Northern CAR with their, their goats and cows. And now that the lake has dried up, a huge influx of people have come and settled in Cameroon and the Central African Republic that were never there before. <clears throat> and that they have settled in this period when the governments had no control or presence in much of the countryside. So the story, the, the study we're gonna talk about today sort of came about by a, a somewhat serpentine route. We at POPFAM had a grant to try to come up with better ways of measuring mortality in poor and stable settings. And we in POPFAM, negotiated with IRC about where is it you think we best could do this, we most need to do this. And at the time, <clears throat> uh, there was some discussion about doing this in, in Myanmar, in Rakhine State. <clears throat> but everyone was telling us that the government in, Rakhine, in uh, Myanmar could actually read every text that's being sent across the border. And the idea of community monitoring just seemed very unappealing. So kind of to avoid risk, we set up a surveillance project in the northern part of the Central African Republic. And when we did our baseline survey, the death rate was really high, like higher than the emergency threshold, more than three times higher than the government said the death rate was. Interestingly, in this little area, sort of one prefecture of the country, our point estimate was that over a thousand people had died in 2018 of jaundice. Probably <clears throat> that was yellow fever. It could have been hepatitis E. It's very hard to get laboratory confirmation of, of yellow fever. When you take a sample, it has to be kept cold and moved to the capital. And so, Everyone at the Ngawandai Hospital was convinced they had a yellow fever outbreak. And IRC and my colleagues went to so much effort to get WHO or the Ministry of Health to go and investigate and to take one of these cases and bring them down to the capital and have them tested and find out what it was. Because with yellow fever, there's a, there's a vaccine that's really effective and really easy to apply. And the government and WHO just like would not touch this because it was a rebel held area. And they did not want WHO resources flowing to the rebels. They just had no interest at all. So I, I was quite worked up about that. And I tried to convince IRC to do a nationwide survey and tell the world how bad this is, because look how bad it was in this one prefecture. And IRC thought it was way too political. They did not want to touch it. So I had a meeting with a couple of MSF folks <clears throat> from MSF Holland and Right away, they thought this was a great idea. The next morning, they went and met with the Minister of Health. He thought it was a great idea. Life was good. Over about a year, the four MSFs who worked in CAR sort of made this scheme, okay, we'll do together a nationwide mortality survey. Each of the four MSFs would study where they worked. And then in the like most peripheral areas that mostly had to be sampled by motorcycle, I would take a team and do those areas. And uh, we had a series of online meetings. MSF was very excited because it had never happened that four MSFs did a survey together, ever. It, generally speaking, the MSFs don't talk to each other very much. So this was like big family resolution issue. <clears throat> and so we submitted an IRB to the government's uh, process at Bengi University. Within just a couple of weeks, it got ethical approval. We're all set to start in February, 2020, and we do start, and then COVID comes. And it was just astonishing how in March of 2020, the arrival of COVID just made the logistic processes collapse for MSF. And they had thousands of people on antiretrovirals. They had hundreds and hundreds of people in the middle of their, uh, their tuberculosis treatment. And they said, you know, I'm sorry, 
logistically, we just can't do this anymore. We need to take the few resources we have and keep our clinical services going. Realize <clears throat> MSF spends more per capita in CAR than anywhere in the world. MSF treats more patients every day than the Ministry of Health. It's a big deal. <clears throat> and so COVID hits and the government realizes that all these foreigners are leaving. And this group called Wagner had been the president's bodyguard for about two years at that point. And the government thought, you know, no Red Cross people hanging around. Almost all the MSF expatriates are gone. This is our chance. Maybe we should try to take back that territory we've been trying to get back for decades. And by most accounts, perhaps 2,000 Wagner forces came and they were inconceivably brutal in their strategies. We can talk about the details if you want after. And they took back a lot of territory, but mostly in the areas where they couldn't take back, they would just make life untenable. And so after a year and a bit in 2021, when MSF decides, okay, COVID has come down, logistics are working again, let's do this. They submitted the same IRB proposal to the same <laughs> Ministry of Health institution and lo and behold, for five months, just like no response. And they were inquiring and they said, we're still thinking about it, blah, 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 blah. And MSF just decided, you know, we can't do this. This is just too political, it's too unstable. And they pulled out. And that guy who I showed you, Gang Karume, that's where he comes in. So I mentioned to this guy, Gang, MSF has decided it's just too violent. They, they're not going to do it. And by the way, I think MSF did the right thing. We can talk about why after. And Gang said, my NGO should do this. No problem. Mm -hmm. And as has happened again and again and again, one of those 18 alumni that had been out with him instantly found a, phil a philanthropist in the U.S., who coughed up $50,000, which covered the entire cost of this study. And the study was begun, in this case, by RHA, but using MSF's protocol and MSF's questionnaire, and just like MSF was intending to do. The study, in the end, had two strata. One that was the government-controlled areas that uh, included about 52% of the population. There was a two-stage cluster sample, meaning that we randomly allocated the clusters to both a prefecture and then a, like a township based on the government statistics. And once we got to the township, I'd never had this before, we had a digital software that had a number for every building in the country. And so we picked a random building within the town that we had selected in our first stage of random sampling to find the first house that we were gonna go visit. And then we interviewed the 10 nearest houses that were occupied to that house. <clears throat> the recall period was essentially 2022. We were doing this a year, we ended almost exactly a year ago right now. We started in, in sort of mid-October. As I mentioned, it was the MSF questionnaire with a bunch of questions about demographics, pregnancies, births, deaths, migration, and then a series of food security questions that we took from the World Food Program. And then we ended with this open-ended question, which might be the most important thing. We said, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us at the end of the interview? And lots of interesting things came from that question. In the end, we had picked Four, 80 clusters, 40 in the government controlled, 40 in the non-government controlled. We made it to 70. Most that we missed were missed for security reasons. Uh, most that we missed were in the uh, non-government controlled, rebel controlled areas. Uh, interestingly, in the government areas, no villages said they had open warfare between two parties. And in the non-government controlled areas, two thirds of villages said we had had open warfare within 10 kilometers of our village and every time it involved Wagner mercenaries. So only about one and a half 
percent of houses refused, refused. Interestingly, not one in the non-government controlled areas refused to talk to us. There were quite a few absent in the government controlled areas, which should give us some pause about bias. And it was only about 6% in the non-government controlled areas that were not home when we went. The mortality rate was much higher than I expected. Uh, remember it was 1.4 back in 2018 and that's what got us worked up. But that was in what I thought was one of the worst prefectures in the country. And the death rate in the non-government controlled areas was quite a bit higher than in the government controlled areas. And especially the under five death rate was more, was like two and a half times higher in the non-government controlled areas than in the government controlled areas. Not by chance, there are lots of supplied and functioning health clinics in the government controlled areas, far, far fewer in the non-government controlled areas and all of them involve NGO support. <clears throat> So I mentioned that we had a couple of food security questions. These are a little subjective, like there's not this tangible thing that you can ask, but they're asking uh, how many of you have less than one meal, one or less meals per day? How many of your children have one or less meal per day? This is a really high fraction. I mentioned these are World Food Program questions. Like, this is freakishly high, even in South Sudan and other very, very poor places. And there was a question that's from the World Food Program that a sort of operates on the assumption there was a current crisis. So we define the crisis as 2020 when COVID and Wagner came and we asked people, how many meals did you eat before the crisis? And I can't prove this is true because people are just saying it, but essentially they said, you know, we ate almost three meals a day before the crisis, now we're eating one. On that open-ended question, when people talked about what they wanted, they wanted healthcare, food, by far. Like those were the two big things they were really, really interested in. <clears throat> Out comes this study. It is in a, one of the nature journals called Conflict and Health. <clears throat> I'm happy to say Columbia University made a nice press release and it just got no press coverage, like nothing at all. We set up to do briefings with USAID and uh, with the British government equivalent. And you know, both entities said, this is really interesting, this is really terrible, but our budget has been cut this year for CAR and like we really are sort of limited on what we can do. Interestingly, uh, a couple months after the article was published, the Wagner forces marched on Moscow for a couple of days, if you recall, and then they stopped. And three days later, after two months of silence, the Minister of Health gave a couple of press reviews, essentially just attacking our study. And their criticisms were, oh, we sampled based on satellite images, which is partly true. We can talk about why I think that's not a major issue in this case. <clears throat> They said, we've done another study and found a mortality only twice as high as we've been saying, not four times as high like they were saying. And most importantly, and the focus was that we did not get ethical approval from the government before doing this survey. And for those of you who, who like haven't read this literature very much, it's actually not normal in a conflict setting to ask a warring party for permission to document what is happening in that setting. And so to their credit, nature gave this a very thorough critique and in the end said, no, I'm, we're not gonna do that. If you need to publish a addendum of complaint, we're willing to post that online. So that didn't sort of go very far, but just fascinating that nothing said for two months when Wagner falls apart, when suddenly this main entity that's creating political stability for the government is threatened and it's not clear what's gonna happen with it, all of a sudden this needed to be discredited. And in part probably because everything we wrote was blaming Wagner for part of the problem that's going on here. So that's the study. 
I kind of want to explore four thoughts, as I mentioned, mostly with exercises or lessons learned from Mailman students. Thought one is, can this crude mortality be right? Like, could the United Nations have only like one fourth, one fourth of reality there? How can, when you search on the internet and look around, you get a completely different story? Can the humanitarian industrial complex really be this hyper political? And then finally, well, if, if all of those things are going wrong, how could we possibly fix this? Well, I actually think there's not much doubt that there, there might be biases in here. It might be a little bit off, but that the death rate that the government claims is, is not even half of reality for almost absolute sure. And I say this for several reasons. I don't ever remember an easier study to verify. And every time I talk to a reporter, maybe I've talked to six or eight along the way, I say this. It is normal in sub-Saharan Africa that in a population, there will be twice as many births as deaths. That is a normal situation. We, we typically in a poor country have four or 5% of the population being newborns every year. And here we had roughly twice as many deaths as births. So if you just go out and talk to your favorite chief or midwife or go to some graveyards uh, and talk to some midwives, like it would be not all that hard to decide, wow, is this birth to death ratio associated with an extreme crisis going on here? And the couple of entities that have sort of informally looked at that sort of agreed, yeah, there's way more deaths than births. And moreover, there's some sort of evidence within our data that something funky and terrible is going on. So here's the demographic profile in the non-government areas on your left and in the government areas on the right. And if we just zoom in to the under 10 year olds, there is a dearth of little kids compared to older kids. This is not normal. Normally there's still the pyramid shape in the bottom because if a population's growing, you've got a few more one-year-olds than you had been given birth four years ago that are now five-year-olds. And moreover, a much bigger factor is little kids die at a much higher rate than older kids. I don't know if any of you have tried to like drown a six-year-old, they, they can't be killed. They're just like really, really tough. And one-year-olds and under one-year-olds are really vulnerable to malaria and a whole host of things. So you need to have you know, 10 little children born if at the end of five years, you're gonna have six or eight five-year-olds. And so this is very unusual. And we can't tell you, is this reduced fertility or is this increased mortality of those little kids? Like we didn't ask the questions needed to distinguish that. My guess is there's some of both things going on. So there's a little bit of internal validity but way more importantly, if we look at every sort of published mortality survey we can find, there's like 10 out there from the last decade, and seven of them are from independent sources that aren't the government or the United Nations, of which they normally are always collaborating together. And you know, six of those seven have a really high death rate in the ballpark of what we're saying, at least closer to what we're saying than to what the government said. So including that first survey that was done in 2020 when MSF started in Waka Prefecture, they found a death rate very, very similar, a little bit lower. The fact that we have a dearth of little children suggests something is worse right in 2022 than had been there in 2019 and 2018. So ours might be a little bit worse, but you know, the notion that the government's rate is correct, is just an absurd, absurd notion. And equally importantly, there are all of these studies by Human Rights Watch and others documenting incredible levels of violence by these Wagner mercenaries. Uh, in one of the villages where we went to in Dele, they came in and they said, anyone who has a gun, we will kill you if you haven't turned it in by next Monday. If you turn it in, no questions, all is forgiven. And 
I've never heard of this before. They had trucks with metal detectors that could drive by these clay huts and detect a gun, like at 30 meters. And so they would identify what they thought were guns. And you know, sometimes it's actually just two picks standing next to each other on the wall, but sometimes it really is a gun. And they would have their spies watch. And when an adult male came back, they would dash in. And if they found a gun, they would take them out and kill them. And they killed hundreds and hundreds of people in Ndele doing this. And interestingly, when we were there uh, almost a year later, most people were happy the Russians were there because now there were food distributions. Now the healthcare system was sort of functioning and they were getting drugs and the care was free. Like the government was using the humanitarian aid to sort of create an environment of, oh, aren't you glad finally these rebels are gone after 20 years. And so the fact that there's been so much documentation of this violence makes our study also a little more plausible. What's really fascinating is if you look over the last decade, there are over 100 press and media articles to the effect of CAR, the worst crisis you've never heard of, or CAR, uh, the worst crisis in the world. And it's just really demoralizing that here we do this study coming out in 2023 uh, and MSF did something quite similar back in 2013 that got ignored and it makes one very introspective. So when thinking about why is it when you go online and you get the death rate or you get anything, it's not nearly as bad as the story I'm seeing when I'm out in the field. And maybe from about 20, 2006 through about 2014, in POPFAM in the forced migration program, when students would go out to do their practicum, I asked them to keep track of any violent deaths you hear, hear about in the places where you were. And like clock, and, and because there was this data set at Uppsala University that is the most widely cited thing in the, pre, in the internet when you're looking at levels of violence around the world. And uh, back then they had raw data and incidents being reported. Starting around 2014, they started talking to experts and modeling their estimates and no longer had data. But the bottom line was, though, oh, sorry, those students who went to did a practice in, in Palestine or in Indonesia, most of the time when they reported a violent death between armed combatants, it was in Uppsala's data set. Virtually all the time, when in Congo or the Central African Republic, uh, death was recorded, it would never be in a solid data set. So that's sort of one insight from the students. And another insight is we did this exercise for about four years where in the PHHA class, where people looked at five crises and they were asked to find the highest violent specific death rate among those five crises. Can you please tell us? And in each group, they did three different things. Like someone or a couple people in the group would use a general search engine like Google or whatnot. A couple would do academic searches like in a constrained search media like Google Scholar or Medline. And then within the group, uh, <clears throat> one of the groups would try to go whatever they thought was the most credible source in the world whether it's the World Health Organization uh, or uh, the CIA fact book or whatever it might be. And fascinatingly, like clockwork, by all three mechanisms, they consistently concluded year after year, Venezuela had the highest violent specific mortality rate of those five crises. And like clockwork, they figured either Mali or CAR had the lowest. This isn't just wrong. This is wrong by like a factor of eight. And it highlights, as doing this again and again and again has, has like made me realize that, you know, a big part of information flow that arrives in the internet is how motivated are the people to which these bad things are happening to get the word in. And if you're in Venezuela, you've got a relative 
in North America. If you're in Syria, you've got a relative in Europe, and there's every incentive to let the world know, hey, they just bombed our hospital. This is terrible. If you're in Mali, like, why would you bother trying to tell the world they just bombed their hospital? No one's going to do anything about it. Like, and so this is like a two-directional problem and that makes the internet so incredibly biased towards the connected and wealthy populations. And this was published in the journal Conflict and Health, if anyone wants to read about it. <clears throat> and, you know, in terms of the CAR data, it's modeled, it's based on a survey that was done in 2010 that only covered the government controlled areas. They had military escorts when they did it in 2010. So maybe that shouldn't surprise us so much. <clears throat> The, I mentioned before that the UN statistics just have this model that says it's getting better and better and better in spite of a, a, in spite of a spasm of, of violence in 2013. The birth rate is completely implausible that they use. They say three and a half percent of the population are newborns every year, in spite of every UN survey I've seen having roughly 20 percent or more of the population be under five. You can't have a birth rate of three and a half percent and have 20% of your population be under five. But just the math doesn't even come close to working. <clears throat> and this shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because the, the Ministry of Health almost always negotiates with those who produce the mixed survey. In fact, there are examples where they have negotiated down the death rates from DHS surveys after they were completed. And built into that is WHO is the UN mechanism by which these numbers come forward. And WHO has to be a subservient partner. Think about it, like 90 something percent of everything WHO does is trying to get people to use a new malaria treatment or to follow the sick child algorithm. Like they're being a nurturing partner, trying to get the staff to up their game for 90 something percent of what they do. It's a very rare time when China has some sort of weird outbreak and they won't let anyone investigate what's that about. Like the policing part of WHO is a tiny part and structurally they're just set up to be subservient partners. And it shouldn't surprise us that they have sort of no spine in mentioning, hey, Central African Republic failing state, what a disaster. So can the humanitarian endeavor really be this political? And the answer is yes. You know, only 6% of the deaths that we recorded were from violence. And even though there are these incredibly compelling stories, people told us about Wagner troops trying to rape every woman in their village or whatever it might be, you know, this was hyper, hyper political. You've got a private mercenary company that the government at the time did not acknowledge existed in the country. When we started this survey, uh, President Putin did not acknowledge that Wagner existed. That only sort of came about in the last year of, of those struggles. And this for-profit company is doing incredibly brutal things in exchange for gold and diamond uh, options. And they're making hundreds of millions of dollars per year. So does it get more political than this? So it shouldn't surprise us that no one wants to touch this and that there's lots of, of information flowing that looks messy and, and different. But if we step back and think about it, like you know, this happens all the time. Like every crisis seems to be political and we can't even really agree on what is a crisis when I go back and I look at the Red Cross's use of the word humanitarian imperative, the first time I can see that word used was in 1963. And it essentially meant that uh, those people who are at risk of death are um, receiving assistance to help them not die. Like that was the gist of the humanitarian imperative. And it's interesting that the Red Cross language has changed over time. And now they say it's the right to receive humanitarian assistance and to offer it. 
No element in there about people at risk of death. Interestingly, in 1990, the fellow who started as the director of this program, Ron Waldman and Mike Toole, put forward this notion that to be a health emergency, a protracted health emergency, probably we should use a doubling of the baseline death rate as our criteria. That got picked up right away. The, the book Refugee Health by MSF was written only a couple years later. They used that as their metric of an emergency. The World Food Pro, uh, pardon me, the World Health Organization used that as their me mechanism to define a, a crisis, health crisis in the 1990s. And in 1993, sort of as a prelude to what was going to happen in the humanitarian endeavor, uh, a guy named Murray, who was at Harvard, wrote this big report for the World Bank on the global burden of disease. And it sort of said, here's how many people are dying of measles, and here's how many people are dying of heart attacks, and here's how many people are dying of malaria, blah, blah, blah. And here's how much it should cost to avert a death for each of those. The mental health crowd went apoplectic. They just became livid because there really aren't many deaths recordable from mental health problems. There's occasional suicides, but in terms of data, it, it's not much of a burden. And so uh, to their credit, the next round, a couple years later of this global burden of disease assessment, instead of using deaths, used disability adjusted life years or DALIs. And so we had this window in the 90s where everyone was trying to figure out how much health benefit do I get from what I do? And like sort of the culmination of this in my mind was the Canadian aid agency, CEDA, had a period of time when uh, some members of parliament who wanted to give away food because Canadians grow a lot of grain and they wanted to give it away, thought if the emergency branch of CEDA is going to fund something, it should be more cost-effective than our giving grain to the World Food Program. And we think we avert a death for every $500 US spent with grain. And so they had this, this rule. We are only gonna find fund things that you can plausibly argue will avert a death for every $500 spent. And so the only grants they got were like measles outbreaks and dysentery outbreaks and testing blood in high HIV prevalence populations and things where the causal pathway was short and the death rate from that thing was relatively high. And it's just fascinating how that had a lot of appeal, but somehow in the years that followed, maybe because some really dynamic people were pushing rights-based programming, maybe because those really acute disasters with high mortality were getting more rare. And we need to think more about broad things like making sure girls go to school when they're in refugee camps and making sure that uh, people have self-esteem and hope. And like, So I'm not sure it was a bad thing that we moved away from mortality as our metric for defining which crises were the worst, but we've sort of gone to a place where we can't even now think about it or talk about it. And I think, I think the main reason is this weird phenomena that we call nationality. Like, I don't understand it fully. Like it didn't even exist till like 300 years ago, but there's this disease in among humans. And, uh, you know, the median income on the planet is $6,000. So we here in this country are making like eight times more than the average person on the planet when we're a median income maker. In the Central African Republic, it's down around $500, so they're making one-tenth. That means someone in CAR, if they can sneak across the Sahel, can make 100 times more money in Europe than they can in the Central African Republic. And it's just stunning when you're in a little village with no electricity, how all these young people come up and show you a picture of their childhood friend who's standing beside the Eiffel Tower. So like now in this era, the imagination is there. And think about like, what do we do with nationality? 
Is it about like preserving culture and language? No, I, I don't think that's how the United Nations spends most of its time. I don't think that's what I hear national leaders talking about. Is it sort of to maximize global well-being and stability? No, I actually think it might be the opposite. I think it might be about making America great again or making England great again or whatever it is. And, and it's about optimizing the well-being often considered as economic growth for these little bubbles. And I'm just so struck that the humanitarian endeavor should at its core probably be fundamentally a tool of equity, like getting things, even if we set mortality aside to the poorest and most desperately needy people, but it's not at all, at all what we do or what we should do. And I have this little exercise I've asked students in the Red Cross help course to do in Baltimore uh, over several years. And I've asked them to come up with like the median income and how much of the federal budget is, the national budget is spent on education and the violent death rate and so on. And what's really, really stunning to me is that, you know, we're going to spend in this country 1,000 to 2,000 times more on our children's education than a child in Mali or Chad or Niger or South Sudan. <clears throat> but I think most of this data is really good except for the mortality data. Like on those occasions when students searched online and I can then find an article like we just talked about right here in our study, um, the mortality data is really, really bad. And like, I, I think we are not, um, we are not all that honest about how our sort of living this wealthy lifestyle is dependent on Congo producing a lot of minerals with very little development and, and that should cause us a lot of internal struggle. So on the upside, there was an article uh, yesterday in the New York Times. Let me see, is it still there? Essentially saying, now that Wagner has kind of collapsed, there is a US uh, a security firm called Bancroft that might be able to step in and take the place of Wagner. Remember, Wagner was not acknowledged by the government. No one in Wagner was registered as they went. So there's this like problem with our law enforcement international mechanisms that they don't work for a government. No, no, no one knows who they are. The government that should be controlling that territory for that nationality is happy about them raping women and killing people and doing all that. So we have no possibility of enforcement against them without the possible exception of someone took a picture and said, oh, this person here at Joanne Chede, they did this on this date and blah, 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 blah. And so now the notion that, oh, we're gonna solve this so by sending an American security company in instead is just a really, fascinating, bizarre, maybe surreal kind of, of thing. So I, I guess I'm hopeful at least they're talking in the New York Times about CAR. They didn't mention how high the death rate is, probably the highest in the world by a factor of two. But on the other hand, one of our alumni just last week got an editorial in the Lancet saying, Look, this study was done last year with a really high mortality. And hey, look, this year the world has cut its aid to CAR. Like, where's the logic there? That's just insane. Moreover, this doctoral student at Hopkins was one of those uh, students who went and uh, did a practicum with Gang Karume like 14 years ago. And she said to me that a Hopkins professor named Len Rubenstein has this project going on and he wants me to go work for a couple of weeks and he'll uh, give me a plane ticket. Can I come work on your study while I'm there? He, she said to Len Rubenstein, I'm gonna go work on Les Roberts' study with Gangarume in CAR and I'm gonna be there for a couple of weeks. Do you want me to help you with your project? So she like lied to both of us in order to go out and work for free for two months and do this survey. And it turns out that she had these skills like how in R 
do you create a confidence interval in a cluster survey when the two populations are of different sizes in the clusters? I don't know how to do that. And she did this. It was just magical. So I feel so good about mailman students. I feel so bad about the world in the Central African Republic and how nationality has allowed that to happen. And on that note, I will stop and ask if there's any questions. Joanne. So the folks online. And for those of you who are online, if you could type in any questions, Catherine will, in the minutes ahead, uh, ask them out loud. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Les. Of course, this was a reminder of how lucky we were to have you around here. And I'm so glad you went into observations that went beyond the article. However, taking you back to the article, as I read it, it was clear to me that there was this story of kind of a perfect storm in CAR, the all the instability, all of the all of the neglect of health, all yes. of the everything. And then there was a, a story about that was essentially a methodological critique of mortality assessments the way they are done by the powers that be. Yes. And I'm wondering if the former in some ways undermines the latter, which yes. is to say, it's just so easy to say, CAR, come on. Of course, we wouldn't even, you know, forget the Wagner group, forget everything, uh, forget the violence. We would not expect an accurate mortality survey from this place, would we? So, I, I, you know, you, you told us how the government has reacted, but we didn't hear so much how the message about the methodological problems of mortality surveys has landed with the, the ones who do that. And we've heard nothing back. And so realize these estimates that are there as exist in most countries are modeled estimates. And normally they're modeled estimates based on DHS or mixed surveys. And so there's, there's like some com combining and assumptions. Okay, we've had a steady change over the last 20 years. They, they, they have these demographic techniques that are mixed in there. And you're right, like there has been no discussion and that is problematic. And as you said, this is just like a, a combination of incredibly unfortunate events. If Wagner came and did just what they've done in Malawi or Tanzania, I don't think they would induce literally one tenth the mortality that they did in this really vulnerable population. But on the other hand, Tanzania and Malawi don't have vast reservoirs of gold and diamonds that aren't getting tapped into. So like there's this self-selection bias that we saw in Congo in years past where groups come in and are really vicious because they want minerals. Those minerals aren't getting used because the government doesn't function and those two things feed on each other. So yes, you are right. And we had a really long debate in the beginning. Should we be picking a fight with WHO over this? And I've never seen the UN statistics this bad, so clearly and brazenly this bad. And so I guess I was thinking we could do two things at once and that was just uh, insanity from optimism. Other thoughts? We, we do have a question in the chat. Um, it comes from an anonymous attendee asking about uh, public health and development financing. Would a shift to more horizontal financing that focuses on a primary care and social determinants model produce better health outcomes in conflict settings? Or are we stuck with vertical programming because of the instability in places like CAR, politics at the UN and other IGOs? So there's many elements to that great question. <clears throat> so one element is, just the amount of money. USAID's budget this year is four times greater than President Biden has asked to assist Israel with this crisis. So like in terms of our weighing, you know, we don't actually give that much as a society into the aid pot. And so that, that's thought number one. Thought number two is there is a reason why MSF is the primary mechanism by which people get medical care compared to the Ministry of Health and CAR. And uh, they can exist vertically without building up a government, without building up infrastructure, and 
avert deaths with some reasonable cost effectiveness. If your goal is to reduce deaths, having these shallow vertical programs, shallow, I mean, philosophically, that, that aren't building up a social in infrastructure, aren't building up human capacity, makes a lot of sense. And so if you are in a country that you think is going to sort of move on a trajectory eventually towards peace and stability, it almost certainly would be more cost effective on the 10 year time scale to work on human resource development and that sort of thing. And so I can't give the questioner a clear answer because if you're trying to avert deaths tomorrow, especially from a measles outbreak, no, I, I think vertical makes a lot of sense. If you're trying to make Afghanistan have a healthy environment in which women give birth safely, no, I think you need to be incorporated into society and incorporated into the health system and, and be building up as, as the questioner is suggesting. So is there another question there, did you say? What would be your recommendation for actually improving mortality figures? Because I think about every time I see the South Sudan maternal mortality rate, I get annoyed because it's based on a 2006 household survey. And from the World Bank Developmental Database, they say they've modeled it to where it is today. So it's very difficult for us to even look at whether or not these big health system strengthening programs have actually improved under five um, outcomes, as well as you know mothers and children's lives and livelihoods. So how do we actually go from, you know, this world where we are modeling everything to where we actually have some relatively good or relatively accurate estimates of not just crude mortality rate, but under five and maternal mortality and infant mortality. Thanks. Do you want the depressing but true answer or do you want the sort of scientifically easy answer? So, <clears throat> I had, in um, terms of getting back to what mailman students teach me, I had this really, really upsetting thing happen at the very end of the survey. Two guys who are our best interviewers, I think, uh, had gone out to a distant town by, by um, airplane and uh, bar uh, rented some motorcycles and had done, I don't know, five clusters or six clusters out there. And they had gone to a house where the woman next door was a single woman and she gave birth at home all by herself. We, we saw this so many times, so many times. And the neighbor went over the next morning and the baby wasn't there and the woman was crying and she wasn't really very clear and they asked, and it turns out the woman had dropped her baby down in her latrine and the baby was now dead. And these two interviewers, both have been to university, are both parents, have both worked for years for NGOs. They are, I think, pretty compassionate people. And I said to them, well, it's really hard to understand what happened. You know, often women go into depression when they give birth and maybe she just was in a, a really bad state of mind. And both of them said, no, she made this choice and it was right for her. And <clears throat> like we went back and forth a couple of times and I didn't want to argue with them. I didn't want to fight. I, I just let that go. And I didn't think about it very much until one of our alumni um, came to visit me, Sonia Stokes, and she told me the story that when she was a resident, she did a rotation in Malawi uh, in an OBGYN ward. And one night a baby came and they knew it was a preemie. They knew it was only seven months old. And she gave birth, the baby came out, it was alive. And the nurse sort of wrapped it up and put it over in a bin. It wasn't a garbage, but she just sort of set it over a side knot on the bed with the woman, like it just was kind of weird and said, what are you doing? And she said, it, it's only seven months. It, it's not going to live, just, just let it be. Mm -hmm. And she said, are you crazy? And she picked it up and she brought it over and she put it with the mother. And, and uh, after a few minutes, the baby stopped breathing. And so she resuscitated it. 
And after a few more minutes, the baby stopped breathing. So she resuscitated it. And then it went on for like an hour and was okay. And it stopped breathing and she had to like give CPR. And I don't know how you do that on a newborn baby. It just freaks me out to think about. <clears throat> and after like four hours, I like get two in the morning, the American head of that ward had clearly been called in by one of the nurses <clears throat> who said, Sonia, what are you doing? She said, I'm keeping my patient alive. And she, he said, you are torturing that child. Just let it die. And she said how in her medical training, in her culture, the idea of just assuming a seven month old fetus is going to die is crazy. But in that hospital, there was no incubator. There was no oxygen. Like there's this triage that's sort of built into how they operate. And she had a culture so far away that, that she couldn't like see that. And I realized maybe when I heard those two guys tell me the story of the woman killing her new child, maybe I'm so wealthy. I'm in such a safe place that I actually don't have the tools of empathy to use the logic of that woman that maybe works for her. And I know this is a repulsive thing to say, but I'm really confused and uncomfortable about the whole scene. So in answer to your question, if we really cared about people dying, if we really cared about equity, that would give us data in the places we need it most. Like if, if we did just a few things like have a minimum wage of $1 per hour everywhere in the world for goods that cross borders, like that would probably lift the bottom 2 billion people out of extreme poverty and out of the World Bank's definition of poverty. But like that's just never gonna happen because nationality makes it so that my Walmart product is cheaper if people aren't paid a dollar an hour. And so that's how I think it needs, I think fundamentally that's what it would take. And we did it with child labor back in the seventies and eighties. Like the world just decided unacceptable to have little children in Nike factories and mechanisms of observing happened and child labor just like disappeared. And we could make that happen if we cared about desperately poor people dying, but we don't care about it. So that's what I think is the real answer. The short answer is we've got the tools, we just don't have the motivation. If every donor did what CETA did in the early 2000s, said, I need to know the death rate before and the death rate after to see if your program was worthwhile, we would have data like that. But donors don't want that. If donors were giving money based on on cost effectiveness or impact per dollar or anything like that, then suddenly all the money they want to spend in Ukraine would not be possible. Like it, it would politically cut out, you know, most of what we do with humanitarian assistance if we had to be cost effective. So that was two answers. One's depressing, the other's just depressing. Thank you, you Les. I totally agree about the lack of cost effectiveness evaluations, especially in the humanitarian sector, because we sort of do process evaluation. Yes. So I, I mean, I, I agree, maybe the, the issue is the motivation, but it's a little bit depressing. It is. <laughs> I think these are sort of call to action of trying to, I don't know, um, I don't know. But in the way child's labor has gone away because we just would not tolerate it in our society, we need largely gone away. We need to not tolerate inequity in our society. And like, there's no incentives in our society to reduce inequity. So we can't even do it among our own. And we think it's cool that like someone who has a few billion dollars wants to go into space because it's fun. Like, like if that can exist, like how could we have a culture in the way we do with child labor that would extend across the world and cost us things and make us pay more in the stores? Yes. Um, so we are just about at time, but I do want to try to squeeze in one more question from online. Um, and it's asking about the value in continuing to do mortality surveillance uh, when there's not resources from the Ministry of Health, from donors, from INGOs to institute changes or improvements to address the causes of death. And is there value in the mortality estimate worth, is, is the value add of the mortality estimate worth the demoralization and frustration of citizens thinking or realizing no one cares enough to save their lives? And the answer is it works differently in different settings. 
there have been lots and lots of settings where IRC shows the crude mortality rate in Eastern Congo is really high and funding goes up more than tenfold within just a few months as a result. Like there are lots of examples like that. The surveillance issue is really important for outbreaks. Like I, I think that the world is way better at stopping even Ebola outbreaks now than it is at doing primary health care in dysfunctional places to keep little vulnerable children who are malnourished alive. So um, I, I think the answer is, yeah, there are places where it's really valuable. Yeah, there are places like Syria where if you've got surveillance, big things will probably happen with that data. And then there's South Sudan and Northern Mali and, and a whole host of places where, as we just saw with our, our, men in, our jaundice outbreak, you know, you just can't get people excited, even though we're pretty sure. And even though your hospital is saying they've had 20 something jaundice deaths in your hospital. Uh, so it depends is the really bad answer. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. And thank, thank you students for what you're gonna be teaching them so that they can like think more philosophically in the future. Yeah, well.